It's great to be joined once again by Dr. Aubrey de Grey, who's a biomedical gerontologist and chief science officer of the SENS Research Foundation, one of the foremost researchers in the field of solving the problem of aging. He's been on 60 Minutes, he's given a TED Talk, and so many other great things. Uh, it's so great to have you on. You know, I want to talk to you more generally about what is new in your field and how your research has been going. But first, I wanted to talk about a, a recent study which claims to have found that some people age up to three times faster than others. And I wanted to see what your thoughts were on this study and tell us what, what that means when to say that someone ages faster than someone else. Well, first of all, David, let me thank you for having me back. It's always a great pleasure to be here. Um, so, yes, this study is very innovative and really quite intriguing. Um, I think it's first important to emphasize that it is quite preliminary. It looks at the rate of aging during early adulthood, uh, during one's 20s and 30s. And that means that it doesn't necessarily say too much about what happens later in life. Also, the particular way in which in New Zealand measured the rate of aging is, you know, it's reasonable, but it's not the only way that you could make that measure. So there are lots of other ideas out there for how to do the same kind of study in a different way. And we need to see that time. We need replication of this. Of course, we also need to see replication in other populations to see whether the rate, whether the variation that is seen in this study can be found in other populations too. But leaving all that aside for the moment, the general principle that some people age more slowly than others is a fascinating idea. And actually, it's somewhat counterintuitive. It's not really what people like myself who work on the biology of aging would have expected both because of the lack of prior information on the subject and also because of the, the, the data that has existed with regard to the end of life, the actual age at which people die. There's a very famous concept called the mortality rate doubling time, which basically expresses how, how, how rapidly people get into a bad state of health that is likely to kill as they get older. And that thing seems to be extraordinarily constant across populations. It's the same in long-lived populations and also in short-lived populations. And the ostensible message of this study is that that's actually not the whole story, that there really is a, a lot of difference out there that is being in some way concealed by population studies which aggregate a lot of individuals together. So that's really the main reason why this study is so fascinating. And, you know, sort of it's it's kind of assumed when we talk about how old people are, it, we're just subtracting the current date from the date when someone was born. And that's sort of how old people are. But uh, tell us, in since you research this, is there a better way to measure how old someone is? In other words, when you talked about there would be other ways to determine what the real age of someone is in, uh, for this study, what would that be? Well, there are lots of different ways of going about it. So this study looked at function. It looked at what people can do and how fast they can run, how tightly they can grip things and so on. Another thing you can do is look at the people at the molecular level. You can ask things like, how rapidly is their DNA changing in terms of the way in which it decides which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off? And actually that's, actually, that's quite a high profile topic right now too, because in the past couple of years, there have been studies showing this kind of thing, looking at the way in which certain parts of our genome change in that regard during life. And again, these studies are very novel, very preliminary, but they again indicate ways in which we might be able to identify people who are aging more rapidly. And rapidly. So, of course, what this says is that one thing that could be done now, even with a small study, would be to compare those two things. To look at the same population at the functional level and also at the molecular level and see whether there's a correlation. 
if there is a correlation, then it says that we've really, we're really onto something. If there's no correlation, it says that we need a better design of the experiment. Okay, that, that makes sense. So let's talk a little bit about the, the most recent developments in your research and in your field. We're starting to read more and more so-called predictions from self-described futurists. And this includes everybody from people like Ray Kurzweil and many others with regard to when they believe that certain milestones will be possible. So uh, uh, one one that seems to be popular in some circles is the sort of uh, uh, digitization of the mind and then the potential doing of something with it, whether it's putting it in another body or living in a sort of computer state or whatever. Mm -hmm. You're working more in a very specific capacity on curing what you call the disease of aging. So what milestones do you look at to evaluate where we are in that? Well, first of all, let me slightly correct you. I, I, I don't really like the phrase the disease of aging. I do believe that aging is a phenomenon that can be amenable in principle to medical intervention. Okay. But calling it a disease is a little risky. So can and we call it, it curing the, the condition of aging? That's better. Okay. Um, the, the, the other thing is that aging is not just one thing. Aging is this collection of interacting but nevertheless somewhat independent phenomena of accumulation of damage that we are... Subject, subject to and that eventually lead to the diseases and disabilities of old age. So it's a slippery concept. I just wanted to make sure that one didn't get too simplistic there. Fair enough. But anyway, to come back to, to, come back to your question, I think it's great that there is so much research going on into what we might call non-biological solutions to the problem of age-related ill health. Um, the idea of uploading, you know, it's, it's not nearly as crazy as it sounds at first sight. It's very, very, very ambitious, and I believe that it's considerably more ambitious and considerably further away than the work we do, even though the work we do is already plenty ambitious. But still, um, you know, I might be wrong, and I would love for any solution that saves lives to actually work. So, um, so I'm all for that research. But what we're doing, yes, our research is moving forward. It's not moving forward nearly as rapidly as we would like. And then the, really the only reason for that is money. The fact that this work is still quite controversial, quite poorly. No, its credibility is, is still limited in many uninformed circles. And of course, most people who have um, serious amounts of money to allocate are relatively uninformed. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a shame. But the fact is we are making progress. We're publishing more and more of our interim and ongoing proof of concept results. A lot of our work is now moving into the private sector, um, being snapped up by um, startup companies that are interested in the tech transfer opportunity. So that's a good sign because our mission, our stated mission has always been to create and to kickstart a rejuvenation biotechnology industry, which is the industry. So, so that's all great. But at the same time, it's always frustrating that we know that we could go perhaps three times faster if we just had better funding. And let's talk a little bit about that. I know that you have launched a or you are launching a campaign to uh, it's a mitochondrial mutation project at lifespan.io. And it is sort of like a Kickstarter in a sense. And talk to us about that. What is what are my, mitochondrial mutations and what is their place in the research you're doing? So mitochondrial mutations are one of the seven big categories of damage that constitute the sense um, research agenda. And we have a particular approach to dealing with them. We've been pursuing that approach for several years already, and we are a lot closer than anyone else has ever been to making this approach work, but it's really difficult. And therefore, you know, it's going to take a long time to get it to work. The reason why nobody else is really working on it is because it's so difficult and other people have different priorities. They're more interested in getting publications or, get, or making profits than they are in doing the best work in the long run. So it's important to us to get this done. And yes, we have started this campaign, as you say. It's not to fund the entire project by any means. It's a big project, but it's to fund a particular part of it. We're just, we're, we're, we're trying everything we can to get money in the door. Kickstarter-like campaigns of this nature are a part of that. Of course, we appeal constantly to the general public to simply give us money directly, um, whether it be high net, worth, high net worth individuals or people with any level of net worth. 
So, uh, you know, every dollar counts. Do you get the sense that in your field there is less sort of piggybacking on the prior research that has been done than in other fields? Or do you think that the different organizations and individuals working in your field are, are doing a good job of working with what has been done and pushing it a little further down the road? Um, that's actually a pretty difficult question to answer. In a way, the sense program was an attempt to improve that thing, to actually get the work on the biology of aging and on delaying the ill health of old age to leverage other work better than it had previously had. But that was an unusual case in the sense that what I did was I went out and identified work in completely different fields, in some cases not even medical fields, that I realized could be relevant to the biology of aging when other people had not realized that. So, you know, that's quite unusual. If we look at the situation now, where science is quite a mature concept and it's been basically the same, same thing for a long time now, um, most people in the bio, who study the biology of aging have at least a crude understanding of what we're trying to do and why and why it makes some kind of sense. And yes, we certainly uh, are very much focused on listening to each other and um, making the most of each other's discoveries. Fantastic. All right. So let me remind everybody lifespan.io is where you can read about the campaign to fund the mitochondrial mutations project. We've been speaking with Dr. Aubrey de Grey. Always a pleasure having you on.